Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Real-Time Whole Genome Sequencing Surveillance for Healthcare Outbreak Detection and Investigation. I am Kaylee Bach of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Opgen. Opgen's portfolio includes services and software for bacterial isolate whole genome sequencing, and Opgen is excited to support this webinar presented by Dr. Alex Sunderman, an expert in this field. To learn more, visit opgen.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This webinar is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education window at the bottom of your screen to obtain your credits. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. Alex Sunderman, Assistant Professor of Infectious Diseases at University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Sunderman, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Hello, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you're listening in from. Um, thanks for that introduction. Uh, like I sa uh, they said, my name is Alex Sunderman, uh, and happy to talk to everyone here today about some research and application um, that our research group has done on genomic sequencing surveillance uh, to investigate uh, healthcare outbreaks uh, and inv investigate them at our hospital. So some things that I want to cover today, three primary objectives, is to talk about some of the past history um, of outbreak detection and the current use uh, of genomic sequencing and hospital outbreak investigation today in infection prevention. It gives us a really good frame of mind about how far we've come and what the future might hold for us. Um, second, talk about uh, a, a new technology of genomic sequencing surveillance and how that's emerging um, into real-time application nowadays. And then lastly, talk about some of the barriers that we're seeing that I think other people are seeing to actually implement that uh, surveillance technique into uh, practice for infection prevention. So going a very long time ago, uh, back into the 1850s, looking at some of the first uh, outbreak investigations that were well recorded, we all know the, the John Snow of the Broad Street Pump cholera outbreak um, in the 1850s, where there was a large uh, cholera outbreak happening within the region. Um, and there were some two competing theories at that time of what might be causing that outbreak, the first being miasma, that there is uh, cholera in the air, and then the second being germ-contaminated water, um, which was coming from the River Thames uh, uh, downstream that was supplying water essentially to two companies that was giving water to these areas where they were seeing this outbreak. And Jon Snow famously made this map here on the right to uh, look at the number of cholera cases that was seen in a certain region within a certain time frame. Um, and a more modern view of that today now uh, would probably look like this with this heat map where you see that Broad Street pump uh, located there in the middle with each of these cases uh, or deaths represented on the map here, showing that the majority of these cases were located within a certain region um, that was recorded within a certain time frame. So the outcome of this it was essentially traced back to this Broad Street pump um, that had the cholera contaminated water. And again, like I said, it, his theory was mainly based upon that there was an observed increased incidence from an established baseline of cholera happening within the region within a certain time frame. And then looking at some of that data, they're able to show um, that it was coming from um, that river where the Broad Street was supplying that water um, rather than the upstream towns and areas where that water wasn't contaminated. So I want people to focus on this, this last bullet point here is that there's an observed increased incidence from an established baseline. So whenever we switch over to a different example, looking at origins of hospital outbreak investigation, it's important to go back to Semmelweis um, back into the 1840s, who was uh, really credited for the establishment of hand hygiene within hospitals. Um, and what he was looking at was um, two obstetrical uh, clinics um, and this uh, incidence of uh, papural fever 
within uh, newborns and mothers. What he noted uh, was that there was obviously an observed difference between the clinic where uh, there was births happening inside the clinic versus births that were happening outside the clinics, essentially on, on the street or other areas. And that uh, the difference between these clinics is that one of them had midwives and the other one had medical students where they would actually perform these autopsies. And they hypothesized that there's a transmission of this cadaverous particles. But what uh, they recorded here over um, a few years, again, was an observed increased incidence from this established baseline where they saw one uh, clinic had a higher rate um, of this disease compared to another, um, which was really important to note to uh, make the intervention of hand washing uh, to establish that. So what does this actually look like on the timeline? We have Semmelweis in the 1840s. We had John Snow and the Broad Street Pump in the 1850s, where we had this, this technique of looking at observed increase from an established baseline. If we go ahead um, to the more modern era, um, in 2016, there was this great paper um, published by the CDC Epi um, uh, Prevention Epicenters Program, where they looked at how do people detect um, outbreaks within hospitals. And some quotes here are, methods used for outbreak detection were non-standardized and limited to a small set of targeted organisms, and they relied on visual inspection of line lists to detect outbreaks. And formally also as well, that the cluster detection ideally would be automated, use statistical-based methods to be more accurate than what hospitals are actually doing at this time frame. And this was um, a survey of 33 different hospitals within the region and found that nothing was really standard among all of these. So if you think about this technique, again, it's still an observed increased incidence from an established baseline within a certain area and time. So we go back to this chart here, um, looking at the 1850s up to now, we're 170 years later and we're essentially still using the same techniques. And that's where one of my favorite quotes come from, uh, what Dr. Sharon Peacock um, uh, said this in one of her papers uh, back in 2018, is the paradigm for hospital outbreak detection has un been unchanged for over 150 years. We're still using the same techniques of geotemporal clustering, looking for an increased incidence within a certain time frame. And um, this other paper that used some sequencing surveillance as well uh, showed that you know this method of geotemporal clustering often misidentifies transmission and misses transmission where it actually has occurred, which is really important. So, what are some of the steps of current modern outbreak detection? Whenever we look at the steps um, of outbreak detection, these are the steps from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in the United States. So, you have to establish the existence of an outbreak look at the diagnosis, get a case definition, make a hypothesis. And at the end, essentially, after you've done all of this, number 10 right here, compare and reconcile with laboratory environmental studies. That one right there is often where we use um, genomic sequencing or some type of genomic method to confirm or refute that presence of the outbreak, but after the outbreak has already been established. So what does this actually look like? Um, there's this paper uh, from CDC folks in the England Journal of Medicine that um, depicts it very well. Without sequencing, we have these series of cases that are unsorted that are occurring throughout time that may or may not be linked together. But what sequencing allows us to do is connect those cases to better guide our interventions, to better guide uh, where we know the outbreak is actually happening and, and better direct uh, our resources. So that's really important to use. But how is genomic sequencing used in the outbreak um, settings within hospitals right now? So within hospitals, we have infections that unfortunately are common um, throughout the hospital that occur throughout. So each one of these dots represent an infection that's um, going on in the hospital. And oftentimes um, for us and other infection prevention departments, it takes one astute clinician, a nurse, a physician within a single unit that will say, you know, I've had six infections, six infections of C. diff on my unit in the past couple of weeks. This is really weird. So they'll often uh, call the infection prevention department. From there, the infection prevention department has to do uh, a really intense review. They have to formulate a line list, make a case definition, do chart review, again, which isn't too standardized. Um, and then and they'll actually start to do interventions, um, hand hygiene, education, et cetera, et cetera. At the end of that all outbreak, sometimes they might perform whole genome sequencing, again, to see 
which infections are related and which ones may not be related to see, do we even have an outbreak? In our experience, and I think the experience of many others, um, very few of these infections end up being related, if any, um, indicating some type of transmission between these patients. And then from there, we'll often tailor the intervention um, to say, do we need to interrupt environmental transmission or a common source? Or is this just an increase of HAIs from endogenous organisms? And maybe we need to have more education on that. And then they'll keep monitoring for different infections. So what do we call this? We like to call this reactive whole genome sequencing. So it's whenever you sequence in response to a suspected outbreak to either confirm or refute that presence of the outbreak. We like to say this is the traditional approach. On the other hand, um, the new approach that we're seeing a lot is um, genomic sequencing surveillance. So sequencing regardless of the presence of an outbreak. Some of the questions is, you know, why don't we actually sequence everything? Why not just sequence everything in the first place? Cost, operations, and interpretation are all issues um, with, uh, to think about with that, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, but one of the things that we wanted to look into is who's actually using sequencing surveillance and what did they find? Because maybe that will better guide us on how do we effectively use this approach. So that's what we wanted to do. Um, and we did a systematic review and published this a couple years ago um, in a um, the Antimicrobial Stewardship Healthcare Epidemiology Journal, where we essentially wanted to look to see who is using genomic sequencing surveillance. And one of the other um, effects that we want to look into is who's using machine learning or statistical methods to also detect outbreaks. But for the purposes of this webinar, we're going to stick to the sequencing surveillance aspects. So we wanted to look at published reports of institutions that have done genomic surveillance. So we use these initial search terms essentially to say, give us a broad catch of who's actually using it. We had um, seven, a little over 700 abstracts from there. And we had to filter out a lot of abstracts that were often community-based because we wanted to look at healthcare surveillance, um, non-infection related, or actually in the end, reactive sequencing. From there, we're able to filter it down a little bit more. Um, a lot of them, we weren't able to readily extract the data um, and we added a couple more. And in the end, we had about 42 studies across the time span up to 2021 that did some type of genomic surveillance within a healthcare setting. So what did these 42 studies find? What did they show? Combining all these 44 studies, or sorry, 42 studies, um, there were about 20% of the isolates that were sequenced were related. But it's important to look at our methodology on these studies. How do we call relatedness is often based upon single nucleotide polymorphism thresholds, SNP thresholds. What we did find is that uh, this figure over here, there is a wide variability of what SNP threshold was used um, based upon the study. Except for C. Dif uh, C. difficile, uh, the SNP threshold was relatively low. But you can look at Staph aureus here over on the right, where some um, institutions use the 50 SNP threshold and some use um, way under 10. So there, there isn't a well agreed upon standard of what defines relatedness, let alone the pipelines were, that were also used here as well. Only two of these studies were done in real time. Almost all of these studies had retrospectively banked isolates that they were able to go back into, pull from those isolates and see what they found through sequencing surveillance. The majority of these, almost all, only used geotemporal clustering whenever they did their analysis. They only looked at where were the patients in the unit and essentially did they have overlap with another patient in the same time frame, which was pretty restrictive um, in our experience. And I'll get into some examples why that could be restrictive later. Again, like I said, there's a vast difference in SNP cutoffs used. But what we did find is that the use is increasing. Over the many years that we um, looked at these studies, there was an increasing, a consistent increase, the amount of published studies that were using genomic surveillance, indicating that the future is probably going to show that a lot more people are going to be going to be using this technique. So I wanted to share some notable examples um, of some studies that were pulled from this systematic review. This first one from Sullivan in 2019 looked at MRSA bloodstream infections that was originally prompted um, by a neonatal ICU, so an ICU with children and babies uh, that had an outbreak. And they, they took that outbreak and they went backwards in time to look at all these MRSA bloodstream infections prior to that. And what they found was a previously undetected outbreak within their hospital, but in a separate tower in an adult unit. And on deeper investigation, they found that the same ventilators 
parts of these ventilators that were being used on the adults during um, previously undetected transmission were then transferred over to the neonatal ICU um, and potentially seeded the start of this neonatal ICU outbreak. So the takeaway here is that if this was done in real time, they could have potentially prevented this NICU outbreak from occurring in the future. This other one from Roy in 2019 looked at influenza for about six months. Um, and they found whenever they did sequencing surveillance that the infection prevention department traditionally using um, our uh, outbreak detection of looking at the H and Ns and trying to geotemporal cluster those often misidentified outbreaks, but also missed outbreaks um, in other units. This quote here down on the right was from the paper as that sequencing was able to uncover probable cryptogenics uh, transmission in one unit while excluding a suspected breakdown of um, infection prevention in another unit. So again, sequencing surveillance can guide your interventions that we're using within a hospital. And this last study here that I wanna show um, folks is from Verbal Caban in 2020, where they also looked at sequencing um, MRSA over the course of two years. And the main takeaway that I got from this paper is that there was vast MRSA transmission um, that went undetected, but it spanned the entire study period. Uh, so they found 16 patients over 21 months in nine different units. So when we think of our traditional uh, detection of geotemporal clustering, of patients have to be in the same unit within a short time frame. This completely gets rid of that is that we have patients that are spread out across time on multiple different units that have suspected transmission that's actually going on. So why don't we adopt sequencing surveillance? Like we just showed, there's a lot of studies showing its value in detecting these unrecognized outbreaks. They can guide our interventions to better direct and make sure that our interventions are going to be accurate. But what are barriers? Is there a cost benefit to doing this? Sequencing isn't free. So will we actually be able to save money by doing this? And how does this actually add up to the traditional infection prevention that we currently do in hospitals? So this is what we wanted to study, study in our research group at the University of Pittsburgh. And this is why we wanted to create this tool called the Enhanced Detection System for Healthcare Associated Transmission or EDSHAT. What EDSHAT is, is essentially it combines two things. We combine bacterial whole genome sequencing surveillance, where this helps us detect the outbreak early. And we also wanted to use um, the EHR data because it's so readily available and it, and it would be time consuming to review all these charts. So by automating this process, this assists us in helping find the transmission route that might be causing the transmission and the outbreak that we detect early. And ideally this system together would detect our outbreak early prevent infections and deaths, and save the hospital costs in the end. So what does this look like in practice, potentially? In the current state of IP, you have an outbreak that takes a while to be detected. Oftentimes, we need a lot of cases to detect this outbreak in the traditional pre infection prevention methods. But with EDSHAT, ideally because of the sequencing surveillance, we would detect the outbreak at the second patient, and we would be, hopefully be able to find what's causing that outbreak, intervene, and prevent any further infections from actually happening, which is where the cost savings come into play. So what does this look like in practice? We have patients in our hospital. All patients have EHR data, and that EHR data exists as charge codes. Patients are charged for their medications, their procedures, their bed location, the providers that see them. That is routine. What's also routine is clinical specimens that are sent to our lab. Whenever a clinician suspects they might have an infection, they culture the blood, the sputum, the wound, any part of that um, culture is sent to our lab. So the only new thing that we're doing here with our research group is that we collect those um, isolates and we perform sequencing surveillance on them. We combine that with the EHR data and essentially do a large case control study to say, where are our outbreak patients and where are everybody else in the hospital and what's common in terms of the exposures among our outbreak patients and could that possibly be a signal that's causing the outbreak to help us identify that outbreak, identify that transmission route, and make an intervention and stop the outbreak from occurring? So we wanted to publish this um, to see what could be a potential effect of this be. And we showed this um, a couple of years ago in the Journal of Clinical Infectious Diseases, uh, the impact of what sequencing surveillance and machine learning of EDSHAT could have for infection prevention departments. So the methods behind this, though, we, we sequenced um, bacterial pathogens for clinical cultures for about two years, between 2016 and 2018, prior to COVID. 
And we wanted those isolates that had potential healthcare associated infection um, impact. So we wanted the clinical isolates where patients have been in the hospital for three or more days, um, or they had some prior inpatient, um, outpatient exposure within our hospital system in the prior 30 days. Uh, this was mainly because we've had experience in the past um, with patients who all have um, outpatient procedures, such as ERCP scope procedures. We'll get these um, exposures in the outpatient setting, become septic, and then present to our hospital ill. But the transmission actually came from that outpatient exposure or their prior discharge. So by using this inclusion criteria, we were able to better capture um, the, these infections. And we selected these species to look into. Uh, these were high impact, high morbidity, mortality, common infections that we see in our hospital that we're able to readily gather. Um, and this was also NIH funded. So we were a bit limited in the amounts of species that we could actually select. Uh, you can note there that we looked at MRSA, but one of the things would be really valuable to look into would be MSSA as well. So how did this go um, in terms of the methodology to analyze this? We use the machine learning algorithm, essentially with, that, like I said, a case control methodology to evaluate our outbreaks, where our cases are as everyone defined by sequencing, and our controls is everybody else in the hospital in the prior 30 days. And this figure to the right essentially shows the workflow. We have a patient with a clinical culture that meets our inclusion criteria for sequencing, and we sequence it and see, do we detect an outbreak? Um, and we identified that essentially by 15 SNPs or lower for all organisms except for C. diff, which we use a two SNP threshold. So if we have two or more patients, we look into the outbreak and we see if the machine learning algorithm detects a transmission route. If not, I would still review the outbreak. If it did, I would review that route and see, you know, is this biologically plausible for actually um, causing transmission? And then we would adjudicate all these transmission routes. And what we also wanted to add in here too is model a potential clinical economic impact, saying if we were to run this in real time, where would we have intervened? And based upon some conservative and uh, loose estimates of interventions, how many infections could we have prevented ideally? So what did we find in these two years? We sequenced um, 3,100 isolates uh, that map to about 2,700 unique patients by organism. And almost 300 of those isolates, about 10.8% of what we sequenced were related in 99 different clusters. You can see there's a wide variability in the percent related. So if you look at VRE, Ethesium, we sequenced um, a good bit and 35% of those isolates related. But whereas if you look at Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we sequenced um, a lot of those, but in the end, only about 4% of those were related. So there was a big difference in, in terms of percent relatedness indicating potential transmission within this as well. We also look at attributable readmissions because of these um, related infections and found that there were a good bit of seven day and 30 day readmissions that were the, uh, due to these potentially transmitted infections that were genetically related. So this next figure here, um, which is a figure that I really like that was created by one of our folks in our lab, um, shows the, depicts the outbreaks that we detected. So each dot here represents an isolate that we sequence, which is color coded and labeled um, by the different species. And this inner circle you see here are all the outbreaks that were interconnected. Um, and the outer ring here shows the unrelated uh, out or isolates that we detected. So like I mentioned before, you can see VRE here in the top in the dark blue. We sequenced a good bit and the majority of them, uh, 35 or so percent were related. Whereas Pseudomonas aeruginosa, not too many of them are related, but there's still some significantly larger outbreaks here as well. So what were some, what were some notable outbreaks here? There are a few. Um, the first two I'll talk a bit more detail in just a minute. The third one here, we had outbreaks of multiple pathogens at this chronic care facility that was a third party um, chronic care facility, but it was embedded within our, um, our hospital walls. We also had outbreaks of multiple different pathogens on one of our intensive care unit. We had um, these outbreaks of C, C. diff associated with wound care, which was very interesting. So wound care in our hospital is a consult service of nurses who have a centralized location who would then spread out all, all throughout our hospital and see patients with different types of decubitus ulcers, non-healing wounds, and then ins inspect these patients. So plausibility-wise, it was possible, and that's why we saw a lot of different C. diff infections in different units spread out across time. 
And this last example here um, shows how specific Ed's hat can get with infections or two MRSA infections associated with EEG, where uh, two patients on the, um, on the same day were seen by a physician and an EEG tech. Um, and then subsequently uh, on two separate units developed genomically related MRSA infections and had no other commonalities other than this initial consult, which was really leading. But I wanna talk about two of these outbreaks, um, which were really important to us and we describe in more detail. This first one here, uh, we published separately in Clinical Infectious Diseases a few years ago, which was an outbreak of VRE ethesium that we traced back to interventional radiology. And what we did um, in this time frame with EDSHAT is that we would analyze some outbreaks with a six to 12 month lag because we didn't wanna interfere with our infection prevention department because we wanted to compare what's the impact of EDSHAT versus traditional IP. But at our six month evaluation initially, we found um, this outbreak of VRE of 10 patient isolates. And what this um, figure here on the right shows is a pairwise SNP heat map of all the isolates that we had analyzed at that time. So essentially this, this uh, red box right here shows a very low SNP threshold under 15 SNPs of 10 um, potentially genetically related isolates. So we wanted to take a deeper dive of what was uh, going on with these 10 VRE infections. When we looked at commonalities of these VRE infections, it was important to note that essentially all of these patients were spread out across different units and these infections occurred through many months because we were doing an initial evaluation after six months. So you can see here um, the, the uh, culture day was spread out over 260 days from when we first started sequencing. And a lot of these infections of VRE were pretty invasive, um, blood, different abdominal specimens as well. The only thing common that was among all these patients is that within 22 days of their culture date, um, all but one of them had an interventional radiology procedure. And furthermore, all, all of those interventional radiology procedures had to deal with contrast injections. And you can see here on the far right that um, many of these infections were also polymicrobial. So I was working as an infection preventionist at the time. So we said we decided to perform an outbreak investigation. And this is the our interventional radiology suite that we had. And you can see um, when you walk in, this is where the patient lays um, on the table here. Uh, on the right, a little bit is the contrast injector where there's an IR technician that will work the machine there. The physician will stand next to the patient with a sterile field that's established next to the uh, physician as well, often with another tech who will handle the sterile field as well. So we asked the, the IR suite to say, okay, prepare a um, contrast injector as if the patient is coming in. And what this contrast injector looks like um, is shown on this slide here, where you have this sterile packaging um, of this injector here and you can imagine if you're reaching into this package um, with an ungloved hand or even non-sterile gloved hand, that you might touch portions of this device that looks like a straw, which is called a quick field tube. And what this does is then this is inserted into the pressure jacket of this injector. And as we watched our technician um, perform this, um, they did not have gloves on. Um, they did unfortunately not perform hand hygiene before this. So they touched portions of this straw. And what this actually looks like, um, and this is from the manufacturer, uh, training contrast and essentially move the bottle of contrast up and down while the injector then um, starts to suck up some of this contrast and loads it into the machine. So you can imagine if you have touched portions of this straw right here, the contrast is also going to touch portions of that straw and that contrast is what is then direct, uh, injected directly into patients next. So what we found is that all but one of these IR procedures um, for these sequence isolates were performed by the same group of IR staff. And there was one IR tech that was scheduled to work on all procedure dates um, of these sequence cases. And this IR tech was assigned to a position where they essentially assist with um, a lot of these cases. Excuse me. So a lot of our interventions dealt with um, increasing uh, the uh, disinfection within the IR suite, increasing, um, increasing the uh, cleanliness, and also improving the practice to be more sterile in terms of the uh, loading of the contrast injectors as well. And since we have made these interventions, we have not detected any more interventional radiology um, associated cases within this outbreak.
This other outbreak that I mentioned before um, is an outbreak of Pseudomonas aeruginosa that we trace back to a contaminated gastroscope as well. So part of um, infection prevention uh, practices may be to culture routinely scopes, endoscopes that are used on patients. And for those who may not be familiar, endoscopes are scopes that are um, used to look down patients' esophageal area into their um, intestinal area or down into their lungs, essentially to uh, examine, take cultures, take biopsies. And these scopes in the past have been implicated in many outbreaks, ERCP scopes especially. And that's because these scopes cannot effectively be sterilized, and there are portions of these scopes that can often become contaminated. So um, one of the suggested practices is to, uh, by a quality improvement measure, essentially culture your scopes to see, are your disinfection measures um, adequately appropriately uh, in actually preventing contamination and possible infections in your patients? And that's what our hospital would do. We would often routinely culture our scopes occasionally to see, do we recover anything? And if we did recover something because of Ed's hat, we would actually culture those isolates as well. So what did we find within this outbreak? We had six um, patients that had genetically related uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa with very few SNPs among all of them. Um, they were spread out off of different units and spread out over 200 days across. Again, so your geotemporal clustering isn't really holding true here. These patients were spread out across time and space. What we found among the first, first four patients is that they all had gastroscopy um, by this one gastroscope A that was used on these patients. So the same gastroscope was used on subsequent pa on four different patients. This fourth patient here, right here, subsequently after their infection had gastroscopy with gastroscope B, which, and that gastroscope B was then used on patient five. Um, this patient six here definitively did not have any gastroscopy no um, formally noted in their chart. Whenever we looked at this patient's chart, they actually did have a bedside gastroscopy, which is very rare in our institution. And we were unable to retrieve the serial number for that gastroscope. So we weren't able to definitively say which gastroscope did this sixth patient have, although it's likely that that patient did have one of these gastroscopes as well. And what we found at the end, um, it, so at the end, whenever we did some uh, routine sequencing of our um, scope isolates, is that we had a scope isolate that was positive for Pseudomonas aeruginosa a um, few day, days after this last patient, patient number six. Uh, and whenever we sequenced that, it was actually related to this outbreak. And that gastroscope was gastroscope A. So it was in a sense our smoking gun within this outbreak. And it's important to note that at the time uh, with our traditional infection prevention, that positive gastroscope was not lost to these prior patients because of that geotemporal clustering. So much has elapsed that time frame that that gastroscope was not linked to these other prior patients. So we did some initial economic modeling and hypothesized if we did real-time sequencing and we pulled that gastroscope at patient number two, we could have potentially saved patient three, four, and five from actually having their infections, probably patient six, but again, we couldn't actually confirm that gastroscopy did occur. And there was high potential cost savings with here. Um, because the cost of treating infections is very high based upon the cost of doing sequencing surveillance. Uh, we have some preliminary cost savings of over $50,000 saved in this um, outbreak if we did real-time sequencing by preventing the treatment of these infections. So going back to our overall two-year analysis, like I said before, we wanted to compare what did Ed's Hat find versus what did traditional infection prevention find. During that same two-year time frame. We got 15 requests for what infection prevention thought were potential outbreaks that were occurring for about 133 patients. And it's important to note that only five of those 133 patients, so about 3% of those patients, were genetically related from two clusters, meaning that we vastly misidentify outbreaks where we think they're occurring. And what Ed's hat showed of our high percent relatedness is that we miss outbreaks when they're actually occurring as well. This is where we go back to that initial quote that we misidentify outbreaks and we miss outbreaks when they do occur because of geotemporal clustering. And this is where sequencing surveillance can really add to infection prevention department. So what did our economic modeling show? Again, we modeled, you know, if we were running Ed's hat in real time and we intervene with some um, hypothesized interventions with um, certain levels of efficacy that were guided by literature-based effectiveness, what could we have prevented? Um, 
in a uh, in a scenario, we could have prevented 25 to 63 transmissions if we were running this in real time based off of some conservative and more loose um, uh, parameters. But overall, we could have saved upwards of almost $700,000 in this two year study period because of the cost of sequencing again is low relative to the, the high cost of treating these infections. And using a probabilistic sensitivity analysis of running different models, we show that EDSAT was cost savings in a large portion of our simulations that we were run, regardless of the um, conservative or loose parameters that we use, which is shown in this figure here, where this, there's this cost savings region where if we're actually doing sequencing surveillance, we would have been cost savings in a lot of these simulations that we actually ran. So what can we conclude from here? Sequencing surveillance of bacterial pathogens and this machine learning of EHR has really high promise in improving our traditional infection prevention um, methods for detecting and investigating our outbreaks. We have really good proof that cost-benefit analysis shows that we can save, potentially save money, um, even though the cost of sequencing is high. So our questions here remain is how do we actually adopt this technology for real-time use? And more so, will it actually be effective? And how do we actually prove that? It's difficult because when we look at this retrospective analysis, again, we, we compared it to the traditional infection prevention analysis that occurred at that time frame, and we hypothesized when we modeled what, what would we have done. But how do we actually say, you know, would that have actually happened if we did that in, in uh, real time? It's trying to prove the counterfactual of an intervention, which is very difficult to prove, and I'll get to some of those examples here um, with some of our real-time data. So we took this um, out, uh, analysis of our two-year EDS hat and did a lot of analysis and essentially said, you know, we why why are we waiting? Let's just start doing sequencing surveillance. There are some barriers into implementing our machine learning aspects that we're still working on today, but we had some good control to actually start doing sequencing surveillance within our hospital, and that's what we decided to start doing. So what does this actually look like within our hospital system? Again, like I said, you have your patient who's hospitalized um, within an inpatient setting or had some recent healthcare exposure as well. And a clinician, often a physician, will suspect that they have this infection, order that culture, that blood, that sputum, skin, anything, and send it down to our clinical laboratory building, which is located right next to our hospital. So that culture ends up being positive. And then twice a week in a real-time setting, our lab, um, we call it MyGel, Microbial Genomic and Epidemiology Laboratory, will query um, culture results as they result every uh, twice a week to see which new cultures each week will meet our inclusion criteria. So have they had that recent healthcare exposure or have they been in the hospital for um, greater than uh, three or more days? And one of our laboratory technicians will also twice a week go down to our clinical laboratory building collect these isolates and bring them back up to our laboratory. And we um, sent them out to be sequencing through some of our collaborators um, internally and externally to have that sequencing performed. We get that sequencing data back um, relatively quickly and we analyze that again for relatedness to other isolates. And in this real time phase, we're still using that threshold of 15 SNP cutoff for all isolates except for C. diff where we use a two SNP threshold as well. And then I initially um, myself, uh, if we find an outbreak, I will perform an initial cluster investigation by reviewing patient charts, seeing what's common among these patients um, that could potentially be causing this outbreak, and we'll notify our infection prevention partners within our hospital to say that we have a new outbreak, here are the patients, here is the preliminary results of what we think is actually causing this outbreak, and um, from there, they will also um, analyze themselves to reaffirm what I found, and then perform any necessary interventions in a real-time fashion that could um, stop the transmission where we think the transmission is actually happening. So what have we found? So we started sequencing in real time for these surveillance of pathogens back in November of 2021. And as of January 2023, we've sequenced a little over 2,500 isolates and about 9% of them are related. 237 um, isolates involved in 84 different outbreaks ranging anywhere between two patients up to 13 patients. And what's interesting is that we're detecting about one new outbreak or one new patient essentially every single week during this time frame. And a lot of these um, outbreaks uh, that we see that are getting larger, these larger ones are um, VRE, uh, vancomycin-resistant, efficium, 
outbreaks. And some of our preliminary data show that, we're, that we'll be publishing soon as well is that these VRE outbreaks we think are driven a lot by rectal carriage, where we see a lot of um, related rectal carriage isolates that have then occasionally you see these clinical isolates. Um, so we all have some data on that as well. But some notable outbreaks that we found so far, um, we have this outbreak of pseudomonas infections associated with a single bronchoscope, um, other, a lot of other endoscope outbreaks that are detected at two patients. And what's important from this is that we're detecting these outbreaks of endoscopes at two patients and then just removing the scope from service. Um, and then we don't see any further uh, transmission related to those scope outbreaks. This one scope outbreak we found um, actually dealt with four patients of two different species. And whenever we removed the scope, uh, which was in a month time frame, they actually found that it failed a leak test, which is um, a quality test to see uh, how well does this um, scope get clean. And if it fails this leak test, it might be leaking some fluids, um, which is an indicator that it could be contaminated or have some issues um, being cleaned as well. We've also seen multiple unit-based clusters uh, with different pathogens, similar to what our, some of our findings in the past were. This other outbreak here um, that we'll also be publishing separately was a uh, pseudo outbreak of um, 14 patients, all with serratia, klebocytoka, or pseudomonas from autopsy um, cultures. So it was very interesting. We found initial three patients early on with serratia marcescens from autopsy blood cultures. And whenever we did an investigation of these patients, we found that these patients had died at outside hospitals, uh, at outside UPMC hospitals, separate from our initial hospital. Then they were brought in centrally to our hospital for their autopsy and had blood cultures that were drawn that had genetically identical serratia marcescens. So when you think of this epidemiologically, there isn't any epi commonalities among these patients when, uh, while they were alive at these separate hospitals because nothing was shared among those patients. But what they do have in common was their autopsy that was performed. And again, we had subsequent other patients with klebocytoka and pseudomonas. So we performed um, a observation investigation, including cultures of the autopsy suite. Um, and what that actually looks like with an autopsy is unlike whenever patients are alive and you can get peripheral sticks, you actually have to open up the chest of the patient and get the blood from the vena cava of the heart because blood is not readily flowing. And what we saw initially when before a patient is brought up onto the autopsy table is that they would wash down this table um, with uh, water from a tap sink. And then essentially it's a non-sterile procedure where they would then try to disinfect the, the area of the vena cava and insert a needle into that um, blood area and pull that out. We found that that area wasn't properly being disinfected. And whenever we did some environmental cultures, because a lot of these bugs are water related bugs, uh, we took cultures of the sink, of the tube, of the drain. And this first picture here, picture number A, um, from the, the faucet that was, it was taken from, we had genetically identical Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, matching that of an autopsy um, blood culture from another patient that was overgrown, likely overgrowing serratia and other bugs on there as well, which was, again, our smoking gun that we found potential environmental contamination that was guided by genomic surveillance and allowed us to have better interventions so that we could have you know, confidence in our autopsy cultures were actually true and not contaminated like we found here. So this is one of the examples where we can use sequencing surveillance to guide environmental and IP interventions to have quality improvement initiatives. So what's our summary here that we can conclude? Real-time sequencing is possible now. We have quick turnaround time uh, within our hospital, which is really key here as well. We can detect outbreaks at two patients. And that turnaround time is really key. From um, our preliminary data, we see about 14 days go by on median from when we have that patient culture date at the bedside to whenever we have the genomic sequencing results and we can make an intervention. About two weeks, and that time is, um, is really important that we decrease that time because during that time frame, we have essentially ongoing transmission that could be happening as well. But real-time sequencing is possible now with this technology. And because of that sequencing, we can direct our infection prevention interventions and we can make them quickly. We can pull those endoscopes. We can guide our interventions to direct to say, hey, we think we have suspected a transmission going here now. 
here's our evidence, let's direct our infection prevention initiatives here. And currently what we're doing now um, is we're analyzing the effectiveness of our interventions actually preventing transmission. Like I mentioned before, it's really hard to prove this counterfactual because in our two year retrospective paper, we, we hypothesized what we could have prevented. And now currently we're saying, you know, this is what we're doing in intervening in real time, but how do we actually effectively approve that, uh, prove that counterfactual data? Um, and it's hard to compare with some of our data because in our current real-time scenario, we're in a post-COVID, uh, uh, during a COVID era where we know HAIs are more common and we see increase of transmission. And if we wanted to compare it to our prior two-year data, that was pre-COVID. So we have some confounding going on that we're working through. Um, but coming up here at the SHEA conference, which is a healthcare epidemiology conference in 2023 um, here in April, I'll actually be presenting some of the, our, our analysis on the effectiveness and our preliminary findings about how effective is our real-time surveillance at preventing transmission. And I'm really excited to share that data at SHEA. Um, so if you're going to SHEA, I would uh, love if you attended the session there and uh, we could talk there as well. So again, we, I wanna talk about some of these barriers to implementation that I mentioned at the, end, at the beginning. Um, again, why don't we just sequence everything? We see that from these slides and our data that sequencing surveillance is possible. You can guide IP interventions and it looks relatively successful at preventing transmission. Again, cost. Uh, cost is always a barrier. But again, we've had uh, an analysis that shows that you could potentially save costs at, uh, because the cost of sequencing is so low and the cost of treating these affections is so high that if you just prevent a few of these affections, it pays for itself. Um, and just last week, there was a great systematic review that was just published uh, just last week in microbial genomics. It was a systematic review of um, cost effectiveness of whole genome sequencing surveillance of bacterial pathogens that showed a lot of promise that, um, that our findings were not just a one-off, that other folks have found that uh, sequencing surveillance can be very cost effective within the hospital setting as well. So it's, you, we would have to convince um, healthcare leadership that, you know, by adopting this technology, it is a cost saving um, long run investment that we can actually use. Infrastructure, it's important that we have infrastructure, the machines, the materials, the actual workspace that we can properly sequence and interpret the bioinformatics. So there's a lot of folks out there that you can actually outsource your bioinformatics capabilities if you don't actually have that in house. And that's oftentimes some things that we'll do internally. If we have a lot of samples, we'll work with um, external partners to send out our sequencing. And they, those partners as well often have fast turnaround times and they're competing to really lower um, that turnaround time and that cost to try to, to try to do more sequencing. So that's always an option if you don't have that infrastructure already within your own institution. Education. It's a very important that you know we have this technology, but can we appropriately use it? As they say in a clinical setting, you never want to order a test if you don't know what you're going to do with that test in the end. The same thing is true with sequencing surveillance. You never want to do sequencing surveillance in real time if you don't know what to actually do with it. So it's really important that uh, we train our infection prevention staff and our hospital epidemiologists about actually how to use this data and what is the best way to actually report it to the infection prevention staff. And from our experience, like we just showed, they, you know, they don't really want to know the very detailed bioinformatic outputs, the coverage, how well, how well did we sequence it? What were the, what were the methods of sequencing? What the end user, the IP really just wants to know, and the clinicians that we go talk to is who are our outbreak patients and can we find suspected transmission routes between these patients? That's what they want to know at the end user. And actually how we um, teach our IPs to appropriately understand that. So then they can then go to our clinicians, our bedside staff to properly display and convey, this is the, this is the results we have and how do we actually make action about that um, with this data. And lastly, support. We have to have leadership from all levels of hospital administration to have this type initiative um, within our hospital. Uh, it's, it's hard to convince a hospital to say, look, let's use this new technology that's gonna have a lot of upfront costs to uncover a lot of new outbreaks we've never known about. 
we're very lucky at UPMC that we have very supportive leadership that wants to adopt this technology because we know the power that this technology can uncover. We can uncover outbreaks that are otherwise undetected that other institutions are not doing. So we predict in the future, this might be the new standard and we're trying to early adopt this to show that we're very supportive in doing this and having quality improvement and improving the care of our patients to make patient care more safer. And that's the message that we give to our leadership and our leadership gives to all of our staff to have the support to have this type of technology within our hospital. So I think these barriers are very important barriers. There's a lot to work out with these barriers as well, um, but there, there are steps to actually overcome these barriers. And these are things that I would gladly talk about with folks as well at the Shea conference here or any questions that we might have about this webinar as well, um, because these are important factors that we're still battling to overcome both within our um, own system as well and as we share it with other hospital institutions. So I want to thank everybody um, and thank the folks uh, that organized this webinar. Um, I'd be happy to take any questions again here within the chat. Um, but my email, my contact info is, are there as well. I'm pretty active on Twitter. So please feel free to reach out if you don't reach out right here. And I would be happy to chat with you. And again, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sunderman, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's get started. We've got some great questions coming in from our audience. And our first question here asks, once you determine outbreak in real time, what is the steps for resolution? Do you use WGS to follow up after intervention? Thanks, Kaylee. That's a really great, great question. Um, a lot of the steps, we work extremely close with our IP department, like I said. So we do that initial chart review to give some inclination of what we think might be causing the outbreak. From there, they then uh, go perform a detailed epi investigation, doing audits and the interviews. And it's very specific to the type of signal that we might be seeing. But a lot of that um, might stem from, do we need to do environmental cultures or do we need to do additional patient surveillance? Is that an actual uh, indication of what we're seeing? And if that's the case, we'll, we'll collect those samples and perform sequencing them on them as well to see if it matches our, um, our strain of concern. But additionally, what's nice about the surveillance aspect is regardless of the outbreak or the presence or what we think is the resolution of the outbreak, we keep on um, performing surveillance on all the future isolates as well. So it, it kind of acts as like a QI measure to how effective were our interventions. Did, did it prevent future cases from showing up or are we still seeing cases in the future? Um, and I think that's one of the strengths that sequencing surveillance can, can give to you. Great, thank you. Next question here. Very informative and compelling presentation, Dr. Sunderman. What sequencing depth X-fold coverage is typically required for achieving the desired resolution 15 SNP threshold? That's a great question. Um, bioinformatics uh, uh, outcomes are important to note. I'm not a bioinformation by, tra by training, so I don't have those um, details off of the top of my head, but I'll be glad to follow up um, in an email about um, the coverage and depth and all the other types of reads for the type of QA that we use. Um, but we do have internal pipelines that we use at Pitt that we developed that has some pretty strict uh, QA measures that we go by. Great. Now, Dr. Sunderman, in a two year time, if saved 692,000 excuse me, 692,000 dollars, how much would it cost to do surveillance in that time by WGS? If each run costs 1,000 dollars, how many runs would need to be done every month or year? So I think that it's important that when we look at the context of sequencing surveillance, we see that there's been a large decrease in the raw cost of sequencing for pathogens in the past many years. What we see internally and with one of our partners um, uh, and what we based upon in our model within our publication is that our costs of sequencing are um, estimated about 70 or $80 per isolate, which translates to different for the amount of runs that you do. 
But that is a very important question of what, what is the threshold uh, that healthcare facilities may need to sequence to see some cost savings benefit. Um, and that is something that we're trying to work on modeling um, with some of our other hospitals to look at how, what are the types of infections that hospitals are seeing based upon the acuity of care and the patient demographics that they see and how much would they actually need to sequence and an estimation to say, you know, this would be cost beneficial. Because it might not be cost beneficial for a very small hospital uh, in a rural setting that doesn't see a lot of these complex patients versus, you know, acute care facility that sees hundreds of these patients every single month. So it's a it's an important detail to work out. Um, and it's something that I hope to, that we can see addressed in the near future. Great. Next question here asks, did you say it takes 14 days from sample collection to having an assembled genome? How much of that is sample processing versus analysis? Right, so um, it's about a median turnaround time for 14 days from the time at the bedside where the clinician takes the sample from a patient. So they take a blood draw, take a wound swab or anything. From that time point on to whenever we actually have our sequencing analysis to looking to see if we have a new outbreak, we see about 14 days. Um, and a lot of this um, is because uh, we are a research setting currently, and we are required twice a week to go down and walk to another building to actually um, gather that ISO, bring it back to our lab, prep it, send it out, or sequence it internally. So I think a lot of the, the time in reduction and on our front could be in increasing the frequency in which we sequence. Um, our turnaround time for the actual sequencing is just about you know, a day or an overnight. Um, and we're lucky to have some great bioinformaticians internally where the pipeline um, for analysis is completely automated. Um, and we see a very rapid turnaround times whenever we can actually compare it to our prior isolates. So I think for it, it's very dependent on your setting about where you can actually um, reduce your turnaround times. Uh, are you a research setting? Or are you sending it out? Or are you doing it internally? Great. Next question here, how feasible is WGS for organizations without that capability on site? So without that on site, I think it depends on um, if you want to partner with an, uh, uh, an uh, industry group. There are lots of industry companies out there that offer um, raw sequencing where you can provide samples and they give you the sequencing data to you know, the, the full end of you, you provide the sample, they do the sequencing, and they provide you with analyses on the output of what potential outbreaks that you might be seeing. So I think it's, it's dependent on, do you want to invest that um, internally in some upfront costs and have that training and onboarding and those creation of pipelines? Or how much of that do you actually want to outsource to um, third-party companies um, and, and comparing those different types of services? Great. Next question. Does this 70 to $80 isolate include labor costs, overheads, et cetera? Um, it does not directly include that cost as well, um, but that is something uh, in an upcoming paper we're going to be looking at the, the cost of you know, having those FTEs in place to actually establish that um, as well if you want to actually have that run internally. Great. Now, what is a typical batch size for a sequencing run? Um, that's something I, I'm not sure off the top of my head. Uh, I, I, I can't com confidently say that off the top of my head, uh, but I'll, I can follow up if you email me. Great. No problem. All right. Next question. This is a two-part question here. And this one asks, or first states, this was a fantastic talk. Um, what bioinformatics pipeline are you using for this? And the second part to this question, is your system able to identify plasmids, transposos, um, shared across different species? And if so, what have you learned about pitfalls in genomic surveillance methods of comparing carbapanamases or other plasmid transposin related transmission in different species? Well, thank you so much for the, the comment. Um, within the pipeline, it's something that one of our expert bioinformaticians has created internally 
um, and using different types of methods um, that we validated throughout. Um, but in terms of plasmids and transposons, that's actually something that we're very interested within our lab and one of our collaborators, um, Dr. Daria Van Tyne, who does a lot of work in this. Um, and we've actually published uh, a lot of uh, preliminary data and a really great upcoming paper as well on plasmid transfer and transmission within healthcare settings. And we're able to show using some different methods than what we traditionally do, that we actually see a lot of transmission um, of plasmids with uh, drug resistance um, happening in, uh, in our hospital that isn't actually detected through traditional, what we think of traditional sequencing methods. Um, but that's something that we're exploring of what is the value of adding that into our routine pipeline? And is it something that you know we can act upon to reduce the spread of AMR? But thank you for that question. Great. All right, we have time for a few more questions here. This next one asks, do you use any patient metadata or epidemiological information as input for the analysis, or is that only used post HOC? So, uh, in a way, so that's a great question. In a way, for whenever we do isolate collection, we look at how long they were in the hospital if they've had recent healthcare exposure. But that's the only type of pre screening um, inclusion criteria that we do for the patient. Um, everything else comes after we detect the outbreak, where we look at these patient demographics, both within the outbreak and then retrospectively in our prior publication. Um, that's something that we look at as well for all the control patients within the hospital. But within a real-time setting, we just look at what are the commonalities among these patients that we're seeing in an outbreak. All right. We have time for one more question here, so we'll wrap up after this one. And this final question asks, when you state you remove the endoscope from service, do you mean it is discarded or does it go through some additional enhanced reprocessing process and then later return to service? Oh, that's a great clarification to make. So um, we, re we remove it from service uh, and then we look to see using maybe a boroscope or doing an additional test are there any defects with it? Are those defects repairable? Um, and we work with the uh, industry partner of whoever made the scope um, to see if they can fix those and address them. Uh, return it, uh, disinfect it again. We do another culture before it even makes it back into service if we're able to fix it. And then once we do another disinfection, it comes back into uh, service as well. If we're not able to address the defect and it keeps failing, um, it would be discarded as well. But thank you for that question. Great. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Sunderman, for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, OpGen, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand and LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, take care everyone. Goodbye.